Okay, so the two big pieces of functionality that need to be added to this, one is how do you remove the gems? In a lot of uh, match threes, you rotate two gems or rotate four gems. Uh, in a couple of them, you draw a line connecting the ones that are uh, um, already matched up and then those get removed. So I wanna do something different. Uh, I don't wanna do something that's already been done so many times because if you're looking to market your own game you really should come up with a unique mechanism so we're going to make it simple you have the ability to click on a block and make it disappear that block gets destroyed and uh, the gems above it will drop and a new gem in that column will also appear if they match then they also get removed so rather than rotating gems to make matches you get to destroy a single gem and hope that you can get um, uh, the gems to fall into place that match. Now, this video is just going to look at the destroying of gems that you click on and the spawning of a replacement gem. We're not going to look yet at the determining if there is a match. Uh, that one is actually probably going to take a couple videos. I'm still going through the best way to do it. Uh, there's a couple different ways, and I'm trying to figure out the one that would be... Um, um, easiest to explain uh, with the least amount of coding. Okay, so let's get started. So what we want is we're going to create a script. And we'll call this gem control. This is going to be put on every single of the pre uh, gem prefabs. Okay, so the way you do that you can just click, drag and drop, click, drag and drop, click, drag and drop, click, drag and drop, click, drag and drop. So now they all have the script. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up that script. And what we're going to do is outside of start, outside of update, we're going to put in void on mouse down. It's a predefined routine, so it's case sensitive, capital O, capital M, capital D. And what we're going to do is on mouse down does just that. This script checks to see if the mouse has been clicked on the object the script is attached to. Well, it's attached to the prefabs. So um, let's make it simple first. We'll just do destroy game object. And again, um, this code affects the object that the script is attached to. The script is attached to the prefabs. So when you click on one of the gems on the screen, this should be all it is necessary to make it be destroyed. Since we already applied gravity at the very beginning, uh, gravity does the rest. So you click on a gem, boom, it disappears, everything drops into place. Click on another one, drops into place. Clicks on another one, drops into place. So that's part of it. So it was that easy to destroy the gem. Now we want a gem to be spawned above it. So what we can do for that is every gem has a standard X coordinate. So as we said, if you go to the far side here, this is a negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one. So what we can do Let's see how this looks. We'll go to GameFlow and we will uh, create a, uh, a static variable. Static variables are different than these. These are not static. What makes it static is by typing in the word static. By making a variable static, this variable will be accessible anywhere in the game. These and this are unique to this script. And this and the object that the script is attached to. But by making it static, 
any script on any object anywhere will be aware of it. So public static, and we'll call it float, and let's call it um, destroyed gem X. A little bit wordy, but we're telling ourselves that this is the X coordinate of the gem that was just destroyed. Okay. So what we do is we come back to game control and we say game flow, because that's the script where we just defined that variable. Game flow dot destroyed gem X equals transform dot position dot x. In other words, what is the x position of the object this script is attached to? So we're taking a local value, dropping it into a static value, and that way a decision can be made elsewhere. So let's come back to game flow. And we'll say if, so in the update section, if destroy gem X. is, well, we can't use zero because there's actually one at zero. So we'll have to give it a, uh, a, a, a number that's outside of the range. So there is there are no cubes being made uh, lower than negative five, uh, four or greater than positive four. So let's say we'll use negative 10. So if destroyed gem X equals negative 10, actually does not equal negative 10. So if it's anything else, that's what the exclamation point means. It means does not. So does not equal. So if destroy gem x does not equal negative 10, then we want something to happen. We want to instantiate red obj. New vector three, and we want so destroyed gem X is the column that it's in. And we just want it to spawn up above the screen so we can go to like say positive twelve. I think that'll be off the screen. And again, zero, the Z is not changing in this game. And then red OBJ dot rotation. Now, so what this does is this doesn't quite get us to where we want to be. So we have this new variable. If you click on a gem, that gem will be destroyed. Its uh, X position will be stored. This then says, okay, if that X position is not this, and it will never be that, okay, if you've just clicked on one, then go ahead and instantiate a new gem. So obviously we're going to have to add the randomize here, but I just want you to sh see the basics because this is what we're trying to convey, is we're trying to convey where we need to replace that gem. Okay, now what's going to happen is we instantiate it, but then we don't want it to keep instantiating, so we need it to be set back to this. So, um, so destroyed gem X gets set back equal to negative 10. And 
Let's start at negative 10 as well. Okay, let's see if this works now. We'll run it. We click. And sure enough, it worked. So click there. So we probably could have it uh, spawn not quite so high. Um, we haven't spawned at 12. We could drop that down to 11. So destroy. Still kind of off the screen. But as you can see, it's working. Now, let's see what happens if we click on two at the same time. I presume we're going to want to put in a control that forces you to wait for the new gem to show up. If, if nothing else, you're not wasting turns. So let's click on two. And it looks like no problems. It, that is any combination of clicking. And all right, well, we did have an error there. Not sure why, but I was also clicking like crazy. So it might have been, yeah, it looks like once that breaks, it keeps breaking. So, like we said, that you have to put in controls to keep people from doing things that we don't want them to do. So that means that once a gem has been destroyed, you want to impose a delay to keep them from um, deleting another gem while they're waiting them to fall. So, what we'll do is we'll create another global variable because we, again, need these two scripts to talk to each other. Public, static, we'll make this a string because it's going to be like a yes or no. Uh, uh, lock, destroy. And we'll set it to N for now. So this is, we're going to track if we're in the midst, if uh, destroying should be locked because you're in the middle of spawning a new one. So what we'll do is, so back on the gem, gem control, you've clicked on it, you've destroyed it, uh, you've destroyed it, you set this variable to this so as that um, a new gem will be instantiated. And now you need to say, all right, well, hold off on any more destroying. So, game flow dot lock destroy will change it to yes. We're going to say that lock, okay, that lock destroy is yes. So, that means we can't just say, if, if this has been clicked on, then go ahead and destroy it. We need to then say, if this new variable, gameflow.lockdestroy, if it equals no, that it's not locked, then go ahead and do all this stuff. So now, we check to see if this new variable is set to no, by default set to no, so the first thing you click on will get destroyed. And we'll spawn a new one, and then says, okay, hold off, you can't destroy anymore, because since this is yes, this will no longer be true. So this is going to let me click on just one, and then no more. So click on one. See, now the clicking is not working, because now we've put in that condition. So what we can do... So we can't really check for a collision. So for now, let's just put in a time delay. It, it, it won't scale well, and we'll have to revisit it later. But at least it'll lock this part out. Um, so let's OK, so we spawn the new object. All right, so what we're going to do is outside of update, outside of start, we're 
we're going to add I enumerator. Among other things, you can use this to create a delay. So I enumerator um, reset delay, we'll call it. So this is whatever you want to call it, and then you add parentheses. Again, curly brackets. Now, don't worry about these first three words. Yes, you absolutely have to add them, but as far as what you're doing, this is what I want you to focus on. You're saying wait for a certain amount of seconds. How many? Two seconds. And then we'll change um, that new gem lock, lock destroy. That's what we called it. All right, so what we've done is we've created our own new routine. It says wait for two seconds and then change the lock destroy variable back to now. But we need to say when to come here. Well, unlike start and update, it won't automatically come down here. We have to tell it when. So very simply, we want it to happen if we've just spawned a new gem because what we're trying to do is we're trying to give that gem a chance to get to its destination so the player can't just spam the clicks. And so in here we say start coroutine, then parenthesis, and then reset delay, parenthesis, parenthesis, parenthesis. All right, that should work. So let's get to it. So I should be able to click, and it works. All right, now I'm going to click and then try to click again. See how there's a delay with the clicking now? So it's giving the gem a chance to show up. So like I said, it's, uh, it's really kind of a band-aid because we really want to base it on collisions but the collisions are always occurring between all of these objects because they're all touching and gravity is pulling them downwards. All right, so we have successfully added the mechanism uh, for the uh, way the player interacts with the game. They click on a block and destroy it. And uh, we now see the instantiation of the replacement block. So I think that's it for this video because the next one is going to be a little bit more hefty where we actually get into the means for determining if you have three of a kind, four of a kind, and whatever else.